Welcome to another episode of Go to Unscripted. We're here at Go to Copenhagen in the lovely Denmark, and certainly in Copenhagen. And I'm super happy to be joined by well, I know it's the amazing Ben Sadegipu. Ben, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you for asking. How about you? No, I'm very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, you've come all the way from uh, uh, California. So, is this your first time in Denmark, or have you been before? For, first time in Denmark. It's okay. one of those countries that I wanted to visit, but I just never got to. So, being here gave me the reason to both visit and come also to the conference and speak. Oh, uh, cool. Well, I hope at least you've had a Danish when you've been here. I was the first thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Scout those bakeries and get a Danish. Uh, there's a few of them behind this menu, so I've yeah, exactly. uh, became a regular already. No, good. I'm glad <laughs> glad to hear it. So you are VP of Research at Hadrian Security. Is it Hadrian uh, Security? Yes. So I live in England. Hadrian's Wall, is that connected with security are, being something that you break through? Or? We are, yeah. We, we, it's pretty much what we okay. do. We break through things. Uh, it's more of a... Attack surface management meets uh, red team automation. So a lot of like testing, security testing, but also like mapping out what an organization has online, like their presence, their websites, their assets. Um, we identify them and then find ways to break into them uh, through automation uh, with working with our platform. So are you sort of the, the pen testers uh, in the real world? I mean, your, your background as being an ethical hacker, yeah. how did that sort of start? And was there an, a non-ethical before then? <laughs> that, uh, or you've just always been interested in security research? So I was, how do I say this? I've always done hacking, but yeah. I just didn't know I was hacking. Yeah. So the story goes, uh, I wanted to play video games. This is uh, something I've always talked about. Like I, I was a kid, I wanted to play video games. I had an older brother, and uh, it was his computer. And he always had a password on it, some sort of protection so I can't go on it. And that was my first victim. Um, learned what, what brute forcing was at a young age. Didn't know it was brute forcing at the time. But um, yeah, I was one of those kind of computer. And then I found <laughs> default passwords for Windows. You know, how do I bypass authentication on Windows? Just never thought it was hacking. Um, eventually, I got into hacking at a young age, but there wasn't any future in it, you know, being a 16 year old, you don't think anyone's going to want to hire you or anything like that. But then later on, I heard about bug bounties. Uh, I have a friend of mine uh, who came up to me. He's like, hey, man, I should make money from hacking. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to do anything illegal. He's like, no, look up bug bounty. Just go type in Yahoo and the word bug bounty. And I guess Yahoo was one of the first companies alongside with Google and Facebook that were doing bug bounties. And I kind of heard about bug bounty and, you know, but it, if people are familiar with bug bounty is you find a vulnerability, you export and report it to this company and they pay you for it. And nowadays, a lot of big technology companies, almost, almost every big tech company has a bug bounty program or a way to work with them. There must be some intense competition for bug ban for finding bugs in those kind of things. Are you a competitive bug hunter yourself? Uh, I used to be very competitive. Um, but I don't have the energy anymore. <laughs> uh, but early on, there was a gamification. I, I was always in the top 10 for both uh, Hacker One, who I ended up working with full time. Uh, eventually, I, I got hired by them. Um, and then I was also with Barcrow, one of their competitors. I was always in the top 10. It was, it was, I had to stay in the top 10 for a while. But then eventually, I learned like, it doesn't mean anything. You know, yeah. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's a good bragging right. It makes you more credible. It gives you more opportunities. But not, doesn't mean anything you know, doesn't mean much in the real world other than just gamifying it and making it competitive. So are there any particular sort of bug bounty programs that you think work really well or, uh, and I suppose on the other side of it, if companies are wanting to set up bug bounty programs, what are the, the good things they should be doing and what are the bad things that are sort of the wrong incentives or, yeah, how do, yeah. You, how do you handle, how would you explain that? Uh, but I mean, I think there is a ton of good bug bounty programs right out there. Um, Apple is a big one. Um, Yahoo's a good one. Google has a really, really good one. Uh, my favorite ones are, um, I hacked on Airbnb a lot for a while. Um, I haven't done that in a long time. I enjoyed working with them a lot. But I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think the way I say it is if you have uh, an online presence, hackers, well, I don't want to say hackers, cyber criminals and adversaries are always going to hack into your mm. network or your applications. So you might as well just invite the good ethical hackers to work with you. Um, and the first step is always uh, what we call, well, when it's called a vulnerability disclosure program, uh, that's when it's like a say something, see something, say something. So you see a vulnerability, you report it, but you don't get paid for it. I'm not saying, that I know people are going to in the comments and going to come and say, hey, don't do free work. The point isn't to do free work. It's more of a establishing a channel for hackers to work with companies that are not ready yet to pay bug bounty. 
Uh, and I think that's a great place to start because it it opens up a place where people, if they, you know, I'm browsing your website, for example, I'm shopping online on your website, I find something critical, I want to report to you, where do I go? Having that established is a very good step. So is this literally even having an email address on your web uh, on your web page, a security team or something like yeah. that that people? Can and also contact? the other one is. Uh, a couple other things that I would recommend is having an inventory of your assets, so you know what's owned by you, what's a priority for you, what applications um, have you know PIIs or private information for users. Having that understanding is a good one. Also, do some pen tests, get rid of some of those low-hanging fruits. Um, it's good for bug bounty hunters. If you don't, they're gonna make money. But you want to make sure you understand. You have an understanding of security, but you also have some sort of a internal process to receive vulnerabilities, get them fixed in an appropriate time uh, because hackers are going to ask you, is this fixed? Is this fixed? So having the two of those would be very, very good. You know, inventory of assets, some testing and some internal process to handle uh, reports. When people, I will say, sometimes inevitably do get hacked, they're going to be sort of good responses and bad responses. Mm. How, how should companies, when they have been hacked, uh, disclose what's been going on? What are, the good pro, what, are, what are the good things you would like to see and what are the really bad things you hope not to see? Uh, I can't give you examples, unfortunately, but uh, there has been a lot of recent breaches that happened. Big, you know, giga corporations, yeah, yeah. huge ones that have been breached. And the first step is uh, just the transparency of it. Yeah. Be transparent that this did happen. Don't let the news come out and say this happened. It's always better when you explain. And also investigate what happened. And I think uh, the biggest thing for an outsider, for like myself perspective, is it's good when companies are willing to share what went wrong. Why did this breach happen? It's gonna come out. You know, eventually it's gonna come out in the news. But when they disclose that information, it gives other organizations a sense of understanding of what went wrong or what could have gone wrong for them to prevent these from happening. So they can put the right process in place or they can put the right training for their uh, employees in place. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. It's just the transparency and also doing an analysis of what happened and also disclosing it for other organizations to understand so they can prevent it from happening in the future. Okay. I mean, and even sort of technically, what are the, what are the I suppose, most common kind of vulnerabilities uh, websites do have? I mean, we hear about your cross-site scripting and yeah. SQL injections and all these kind of things. Um, is that mostly a solved problem now or you still find those kind of things? And then what, what, are, what sort of security vulnerabilities should, um, should people be looking at or open doors should people be looking at? Yeah, um, cross-site scripting is still a thing. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's ever going to go yeah. away unless we find a way to not take like user input and user data. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's going to go away. I think it's more common with legacy sites um, a lot of the bigger organizations that have been around for years, I think they are more prone to have them. I think the more, I don't want to say it's completely fixed, but the more modern stack technologies are, they use libraries and they use other third-party things to prevent cross-site scripting, but it still happens. Um, I'd be surprised to say it never happens, honestly. Um, that's a really big one, but depending on, I think with today's technology, it's harder to exploit. Uh, you have you know things that are in place that could prevent it. People have other ways of handling cookies and things like that. Um, the other two big ones is uh, something that I really, really I did a lot of research and really enjoy is uh, a vulnerability called uh, server-side request forgery, which pretty much allows to use your application as an internal resource to talk to things that are behind a VPN, for example. So it's gated in another network, mm -hmm. but because this application speaks to it, if they hack into this application, they can also speak to these other services. So I would give an example for AWS. If you have uh, an stuff on AWS, you can query metadata where your keys are stored, for example, that gives you access to other applications. Or it could be that you can talk to some other microservices behind it or stuff that are supposed to be internal. And you can find those in anything, any of the integrations, any webhooks, uh, PDF generators are a big one and a fun one. I did a year of research on those, which was really, really cool. Uh, and it's just... Uh, the possibilities of things you can do with an SSRF is just unlimited. You can either command, execute, you can query data, you can speak to services. It's just incredible what you can do with it. Um, to name a few companies, I think Snapchat, Lyft, um, Verizon Media were some of the recent ones that I, you know, I found these vulnerabilities in. Um, and then the third one is uh, an insecure direct object reference, IDOR. That's where it allows you to pretty much, uh, if you go to like um, the API, 
So when you query your profile, um, it's going to go to an API. It's going to say, hey, here's my user ID. Unfortunately, a lot of cases that user ID is an integer that's incremented by one for every mm -hmm. user, right? So I'm user one, user two, three, four, five, six, right? And all the way to like a million. And if you change that ID and the API call from one to two, in some cases, it may give you, in most cases I've seen that actually, the user information for the other user. That alone isn't a vulnerability, but in some cases, that API call could be, you know, user ID slash address that gives you an entire address. It yeah. could be there, you know, for let's say for an example, uh, a shopping site. It could be everything you have bought. It could be a receipt. It could be an invoice, right? It's invoice slash one two three four five. I go through and I say one two three four six, and that gives me your address, what you have bought, your last four, your credit card number, and all those like PII. So that's a really big one that I still see to this day. It's more of an authentication authorization issue. But it's still very, very common nowadays in, uh, in the modern days application. So, is there any API design stuff that people should be thinking about? Because <clears throat> one is authorization authentication once you're in, but you know people are wanting their APIs to be simple to consume. Um, but then it maybe does make it even easier to be able to traverse these paths and guess slash invoice slash yeah. details or that kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, the big one is just authentication authorization. Don't assume that you're handling things. <laughs> It gets even messier when it's like organizations, because then under organizations you have like different user roles, different you know users. They're always the assumption is because they're gated, they can't speak to each other. That's not the case, really. You just have to traverse other you know organization and then brute force for the next user ID. Um, other than that, there's there's a ton of other different things. Um, I think one would be not assuming just because a functionality isn't visible in the user interface, it's not accessible or discoverable. Security by obscurity. Yeah, yeah it's uh, just because you're not visibly showing the users this functionality, it doesn't mean that I can't find it through your JavaScript files, for example, or that I can't just brute force for it, guess the folder file name for it, right? Uh, those are the, big, the, the two big ones. And also how you parse data when a user is sending you data, how you're sanitizing that data. Yeah, so you yeah, use the sanitization in the function or the code as soon as it's arriving, or even on the API, I suppose. There's a, I know yeah. they, a lot of API products have hopefully robust um, yeah, user sanitization or use at least um, a mapping template that you need to go through to um, check that you, you're not, not sending some strange stuff. Yeah, and then just not assuming things, yeah. just not assuming that, you know, already been checked, already been secured, whatever that is. The assumption is the biggest one. Does cloud make any of this security simpler or does it make it complicated or is it, I um, presume it's also more nuanced than this, that it can, it can, be, can be both? I think it can be both. I think it makes it secure because they give you more tools to you know make these things secure, right? Like, you know, when you're, for example, using AWS, you have all these different things that could help you protect your application, your user's data. But at the same time, if they're not gated properly, one application gets hacked. If you haven't separated them by the keys, by the user roles and the IMs, then everything, you've pretty much given yeah. them the keys of the kingdom. And you'd be surprised how many times that's happened. You know, when I hack into a company, I get some sort of keys for them. Um, I have access to everything because, whoops, they forgot to, you know, yeah. uncheck that one box. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of both. It's, they give you the resources. But it's also very complicated. There's like, so many resources and all, all these different micro apps that you can use, but then the user is confused. How do you use every single one of them? How do you make them talk to each other? So I think it does a little bit of both. Yeah, and I suppose that comes back to what you were saying before, having an in inventory of all your resources and what you have, so at least you know what you need to protect uh, rather than just flying blind and you know just protecting your API. You need to step back from that and have a you know have protection mechanisms for your, your data, whether that's at risk or uh, in flight, and how it's stored and how it's accessed as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I think having that inventory helps you know what's at risk and having the way of prioritizing it also helps to know, you know, these things are, these are the applications that could be uh, either very vulnerable, it could be you know, very uh, important to an adversary and all that stuff. It's just having an overview map of things to take a look at is also very, very important. So if somebody is keen on getting into the ethical hacking business, I know you've got a workshop and you help people to do that, what are the sort of things they should start? Or should they just be, you know, opening the U.S. Department of Defense's webpage and just, you know, going straight in there and seeing what they can, how, how they can get in? I think that <coughs> depends on uh, the person's knowledge. It's uh, where are you in your yep. your studies, for example? Where are you in your career? I think it's easier to make that jump from a development perspective to ethical hacking because you kind of know how things work. You've built, you know, how to build these things. It's now how do I break them? So if I throw terms at you, it's easier for you to understand because you understand as a developer, not as a hacker, right? 
Uh, so that's a big one. There are a ton of online resources nowadays. Um, some of my favorites are Try Hack Me, Hack the Box, uh, Pentester Lab, um, ctfchallenge.co.uk is a really good one. Uh, bugbountyhunter.com. It's all these different resources. Depends on your style of learning. I would say, you know, enroll in those. I think it's like 10, 12 bucks a month. In some cases, they're free. Uh, Burb Suite, it's a tool everyone uses by Portswigger. Uh, they have a free version, WebSec Academy. Go through those and learn the basics. But you're absolutely right. Once you've learned the basics, the best way to do these is just to get your hands on the keyboard and actually start to hack. Uh, and to learn. And uh, I think the best way to do it is I personally recommend for new people to go look at vulnerability disclosure programs. These are programs that don't pay you, but it gives you an idea of how things work. So you can build your own methodology on how to hack. And there's a why I say that is a lot of the top hackers are going after bug bounty programs that pays. And there is a lower chance for you to find things in your early days mm -hmm. because you're still learning. So I always recommend starting with a disclosure program and then making your way up. And I suppose you were saying that uh, you know there's got to be an interest and a passion to find and discover things. Um, you know, people saying that uh, programming, you know, eighty percent of programming is, is um, putting bugs in, and then the other eighty percent is taking bugs out. Yep. Uh, so I mean, as people are developing in their IDEs or in the cloud or you know <clears throat> JavaScript, Python, Node, whatever um, you know Java, whatever language they're using, uh, you know, the whole handling of bugs is part of the development lifecycle. And I suppose this is just now taking it a, a, another step. And instead of troubleshooting and you know finding your own bugs, you're finding other people's bugs. Um, but that takes time. I mean, programming is not just sitting in front of a keyboard and just you know learning how to type or something. There's a there's a lot of skills required in programming. So, yeah. what kind of skills should people be thinking of if um, if hacking and you know finding bugs is of interest? Uh, you know, how can people get better in their programming skills? Uh, the I think the big one is just uh, programming is a portion of it. I don't I don't like code, but I understand ten percent of most languages, like I can kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, the other one is, uh, I think learning how to Google is a big one. Uh, I think 90% of my job is Googling things, like even some various, you know, basic things. I've learned that knowing everything by heart isn't going to get me far. Yeah. I just have to know how to Google for it. And knowing how to look things up efficiently to be able to find the answer within three or four uh, Google crew is a very, very big, I think it's a very good skill to be honest. Time saver too, yeah. It, it, it saves you a lot of time, absolutely. And also, um, I think the biggest thing is understanding that no matter if you're a developer, you're a hacker, whatever it is that you're doing, that it's, it's a never-ending learning journey. You're never going to stop learning. It's not that, okay, today I know cross-site scripting, SSR, IDOR, I'm done, I can go make money. No, those things become harder to find, new techniques come out, you're every day challenged and pushed to learn new things, and being open to that is a big game changer. It's the same thing with development, right? Like, PHU was a big one, it still is, but you have all these different new languages that have came out recently that are more prominent that people use that you have to, you know, learn and uh, keep up with. It's the same thing, you have to make sure you're open to learning every day. I suppose there are two sides. We talk, we've been talking about sort of red team kind of stuff where you are, you know, finding the vulnerabilities, but there's a whole other sort of blue team kind of stuff where you're defending against the vulnerabilities. I mean, is that two sides of the same coin, just different kind of skills, or how do you think about that? Yeah, I would say, you know, blue teams are more uh, the exact opposite of each other, blue team and red team. Red team, you're breaking in. Blue team's job is to catch you and mitigate things. Um, it's pretty much, yeah, there are two different sides of it. I think as a blue teamer, you're more on the defensive side. How do I quickly catch these folks that are hacking in, how do I prevent it? And if you have a red team background, it helps you a lot more because you can think like an adversary. But we're red teaming, with the stuff that I do at least, I'm not a red teamer really. I, I wish I was a red teamer, I'm not, I'm not there yet at least. But with a lot of things that I do to bring into a company, I'm not too worried about what the blue team is doing. Uh, I mean, especially with bug bounties because I don't care if I get caught, right? With red team, they, want, they don't want to get caught, they want to stay and they want to like mm -hmm. elevate their access and go through the entire process. But for someone like me, I don't really have to worry about the defensive side, but it, it helps when I know how a developer thinks. Can I guess what the thought process was when they were writing this piece of code? So if they're writing an uploader for you can upload your images, what are some things they thought about to put in place or prevent it that I could break out of or exploit for my own good? How, how should people think about if they are hacking something or connecting to something? There obviously are ethical concerns and moral concerns, and I'm not just talking about uh, you know, a company losing money because you've managed to you know, stop their payment gateway or whatever, but I mean, there's, there's personal information out there, there's private information out there, you know, there are hacks where you know, 
you know, power stations and power grids are being sh uh, shut down. You know, is there a line that can be crossed, or is it just uh, people being inquisitive? Uh, we've got nation states, you know, pouring billions into hacking. I mean, this is this is big, big, big business, um, which, as IT gets more prevalent, is just going to get even bigger. I think there's always a line you can you should not cross. Um, so, for example, with my case, I can't talk about stuff like SCADA power grids because that's a complete effing ball game. It's, you know, when you have access to like an electrical thing that could bring the whole grid down, yeah. there, you shouldn't cross that line to like see, oh, can I flip this switch? That's a completely different thing. But when it comes down to like um, your PIs or information, yeah, there is a line. Um, Proof of exploitability, you know, like if you, if I want to prove that this is a vulnerability, do I query three or four users, or do I query the entire database of users that this company has? Right, mm -hmm. that's the line that you, you decide to cross. If I'm already in an internal server, you know, if I've already breached the, you know, into the internal access in the internal network, there is a line: do I go and dump the database, or do I just prove that I can dump the database? Right, I don't have to actually do it, but I can say, hey, I have access to this thing that could potentially. Than the database. I think ethically, it's just uh, knowing. I think at, at our core, we all know what is right or what is wrong, and it's just choosing to go with your gut feeling of. If there is a question of should I be doing this, the answer is always no. Yeah. If you're questioning it, you know the answer is no, but it's just more of a, how do I justify that I want to do this? And it can be exciting, I'm sure. If you're getting further deeper into something, it can be exciting. You've got access to more data. You want to keep going, um, but you've sort of made your point, and you sometimes yeah. take, a, take a break, have a coffee, and then think about what you're doing. There's been a few times <laughs> when I've uh, been in, a, in an internal network of a big retailer in the U.S., and there was almost anything that I wanted to access was unethicated. Um, it was very tempting to go, hmm, I wonder how much more damage I could do with this. And uh, there's been times that I've asked companies like, hey, I have this like, assumption that I could do X, Y, and Z. Could you let me try them? And some companies are open to it. A lot of cases they're not open to it. This company was like, no, our SOC team is already very unhappy about what you're doing. Can you just drop it? Um, but I, yeah, but I mean, there is always that, you know, I wonder what else I could have done or like, you know, I wonder how bad this breach could have been, especially when it's like a big, big organization, right? When it's like a, I use uh, Lyft as an example. Uh, it's a company that I publicly worked with. There's been a few times I'm like, I wonder what else I could have done with this, but I will never know. Mm. Um, sort of flipping it around, what can people do to protect their private information and to, as more of our lives become online, you know, our you know, addresses and children's information and school things and everything and work information and, you know, medical information is all out there. Uh, what can people to, uh, do other than just battening down the hatches and not posting anything online? Or is that what you should be doing? I, I don't, I mean, realistically, that's probably the solution, but also not realistic yeah, yeah. because... You need to live online. Yeah. We all live online in today's age. Um, I think it just comes down to, do you really need this website? Like, do you have to give them your information? If you're shopping online, obviously you have to give them your address because yeah. then how are they going to deliver something to you? You don't have to always give them your real address. You know, in a lot of cases, I just go one, two, three, test street. They don't need to have my address if they ask for it. You're not going to send me anything. You're not sending me mail. We don't need to talk. So you don't have to give them information. Uh, that's a big one. But also, I think for... I think the majority of people, that's the biggest issue is just uh, the security hygiene. A lot of, uh, especially with the older generation that internet's new to them, they're still not you know, familiar with what to do. It's just educating people, ever, even at a young age when they get into security, into computers, like how do we educate them so they protect themselves online, but also showing the older generation how to do these things as well. Uh, the biggest one is like password management is a big one. Um, it's always, you know, I joke with my friends, they're like, oh, don't look, I'm going to type in my password. I'm like, let me guess, it's like your dog's name plus like a number. How did you know? How did you, you know? know? And, and that's the reaction, yeah. right? It's like, oh my God, did you know my password? I'm like, no, but thank you for the reaction because it shows me that mm. you just like everybody else, you're human. You're going to put your wife's name and the year you guys met. That's like the password for most people. Educating them, like, hey, make it something else. Make it a sentence. Make it, you know, instead of I love my wife, make it... I love my wife because X, Y, and Z. So it's something a lot more mm. random than just knowing their name and their year of birth because that information is always online and not using that data that could be you know, scraped online about you and you know, security questions or passwords and that kind of thing. So how do people put enough variety in their passwords that ultimately you want a unique password for every site? But uh, you know, I know, you know plenty of people who would find that very difficult to do it. Um, so is it a long password using a sentence? 
how would you add some variety in to make it unique for, for sites? What sort of tips I would use a do? password manager. Yeah. Um, password managers do that for you. All you have to do is remember one password. I don't know there's a company called One Password. Uh, you sign up for them. They manage your passwords. People are like, what if they get hacked? Mm. It's a lot harder to hack into like, a company yeah. that's invested in protecting your data um, than a lot of corporations also use. Then like, hacking you is a lot mm. easier. So use something like that, and then you have to use you have to remember that one password that you just have to remember. That's going to be hard. It's something that you're always going to remember, um, and they create passwords for you based on every site. And it's very easy to use on your laptop or your computer. It's very easy to use on your phone. You literally, it's like your regular phone. It's a Face ID for an iPhone. It asks you what app you want to use. You click on your password management, and it logs you in automatically. There's two steps you have to take, but those two clicks protect you from getting your account hacked. So. If the next big breach happens and your password was in that breach and you use that password for your bank, for your social media, for your email, I have access to everything. All I have to know is what is your email address and what bank do you bank with? And it's not hard to guess those banks because let's be real, in every country there's five or six banks that are major, right? And it becomes easier. Uh, Two-factor authentication is a big one. Uh, people tell me like, don't say two-factor, you should do multi-factor, you know, like don't do the SMS one, do apps. I'm like. Someone that's like my, you know, my mom's age or my dad's age, their threat model is different than you yeah. and I, right? Like, no one's gonna go and sim swap my mom to get to their bank account. Like, they're gonna give up. But for me, it's a different profile. But having that, I'd rather have someone like, you know, my 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 parents or my elders. Like, I would rather have them use a text message two-factor authentication than not use one at all. Uh, I get the argument on why you should do one or the other, but it's just more of a having that in place, a good place because it protects them. It's an extra layer of protection. Even if you're using, you shouldn't be using the same password, but if you're using the same password over and over, at least you have that layer of protection when they text you your factor within two-factor authentication to log into your account. Do, I mean, uh, as you know, people that go to are you know, developers and IT professionals, are there better things that they should be doing? Because a lot of IT people have full admin access to you know, a lot of systems when they're developing code. Uh, you know, maybe they've got protections in CI, CD pipelines that have separate accounts or separate usernames and passwords or uh, access keys. But yeah, you know, uh, a tip or two for IT professionals to um, improve the security posture of their companies? Um, I mean, one is the obvious one. Personal passwords and work passwords should be different. <laughs> uh, I think the training is a big one. Um, train people not to click on links. Um, it always starts with uh, the more entry-level positions at the company, and they can always elevate up. Um, it's just the security hygiene of like the things you do personally, but also doing them at a bigger scale with your company. I think education is a big part. I don't think we spend enough time educating people why security is important. Uh, always the question is, who's going to hack me? You will be surprised. They don't, they're not, you're not the primary. You are a part of a bigger grand scheme of like plans. Um, those are probably the biggest ones. Uh, phishing and you know whatever ishing you want to say, phishing, phishing. There's like a bunch of different varieties of it, variations of it. Training for those is a big one. You get a phone call, and I've gone as far as like when my bank calls, I ask them, confirm you're my bank. How do I know you? You, you just call me from a number. It's a one hundred number. How do I know that's a real number, right? Uh, training for those things is a big one. Uh, someone calls you and says, hey, I'm calling from your IT department. How do you verify? hang up and call them back, or have some sort of a two-layer protection where they can confirm that this is, in fact, who they say they are. Yeah, and I suppose also taking control of your of yourself. I mean, I, I know you get scam calls and it's from the tax office saying, oh, you owe, owe us lots of money, and it's a you know, heavily accented English uh, recorded message, and that's just obvious that it's somebody yeah. else. But I know other people who have been called and that they have got the right bank, and they do assume it is, uh, it is the right bank, and to never be rushed into making a decision or transferring money or doing anything like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, and they're getting better and better. Yeah, as, yeah. You know, they're getting very much more, more accurate. You know, the background noise sounds so real. Even there's like a YouTube video in the background playing. But yeah, it's the biggest one is just not assuming the zero trust. It's just having zero trust that whoever's on the other side isn't telling you the truth. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a hotel called me recently. And like, hey, you have. Uh, we want to give you this deal. It's a very good deal for like a six-day vacation for very cheap. And I go, okay, this is a scam. And they're like, no, it's not. I'm like, I don't believe you. Can you confirm? This, I made this lady go. I give me her phone number. 
to call, and I was like, hey, I need you to tell me to go on this website. What is your website? So I can go on it. It was like a big hotel brand. And she's like, go to our website, click on the link down below, go to this number that's on the screen on the website. I need you to call them and confirm that my name so-and-so works at this company. Here's my extension number. Put her on pause. Call on the other side. like, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so. Can you confirm? The lady was like, yep, I'm the manager. Uh, I confirmed that this person works for us. So I went back and was like, I apologize, but I'm just getting one too many <laughs> scam calls. And you're asking me to not only give you X amount of dollars, but you want my credit card number and you have my phone number. And like, I have to confirm you are who you say you are. Mm. I wouldn't shy away from it. You know, if you're spending money, you're spending $1,000 to go to his vacation. The least you can do is put him through that process of proving they are who they say you are. they are for your own protection. I suppose turning that around, customers, um, companies must set themselves up that they can be contacted and without giving private information about all the employees, there must be a way in that somebody can verify who works there and, and what's legitimate. Yeah, and even you came and trust the fact that it says, like, can you confirm, you know, you work for the company because how are you going to confirm that, right? Like, yeah. can you give me my address? Who do you can, phone, yeah. Yeah, you know, the thing is, like, can you tell me my address? They can find that information on you in yeah. some cases. Um, so just verifying the data on your own is always the best bet. So just coming back around to what we started about sort of career and uh, and hacking, I know you run a course. Um, <clears throat> is that, uh, I mean, I'm sure that's a really great way that people can uh, at least get interested in, in, in ethical hacking. What are the details of that? How do people find it online? Yeah, uh, first of all, like, if you want to learn things, um, the course isn't always a way. Uh, the reason why I say that is, I think today's age, almost everything you want to learn is found online. The way, the reason why I've created a course is more of a, people ask like, we want to learn from you. How do you, do you approach this thing? So if you want to learn my approach to hacking and bug bounties, the course is very valuable. But I highly recommend doing some research on the, you know, at first before you uh, purchase the course. Uh, the course is called uh, Intro to Bug Bounty and Web Hacking. Uh, right now it's uh, hosted on Udemy. It's just easier to host than anywhere else. Then I go to conferences and present it. And we could always look for it. Uh, it's online. You know, it's uh, it's not that expensive. We can look for it on Udemy. It will pop up. And there's also, um, if people want to look for bug bounty resources, if you're typing bug bounty resources, literally the three words, uh, the first thing should be a GitHub report that belongs to me to have all these different resources, including my course, some other free uh, applications, websites, books, uh, all those things that they can use as well. Excellent. Uh, how else could people contact you on are you on social media? How would people get in touch if they have any questions? Uh, I am on all social media except Snapchat. I make it a point to say this. Oh, yeah. uh, Is there a reason for that? <laughs> um, not really. It's just funny to say because uh, no, a lot of enough, kids yeah. use it. So I just go, I'm on every platform except Snapchat. <laughs> uh, it's always the same thing. I go by Nahamsek, N-A-H-A-M-S-E-C. So at Nahamsek, I'm on Instagram, Twitter. I'm very um, active on Twitter. I have a YouTube channel, Twitch channel. Uh, people can you know tune into and hear from me. Excellent. Well, Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us on GoTo Unscripted here in Copenhagen. Uh, it's amazing to be able to talk to some of these amazing speakers who've got such super interesting information in beautiful Copenhagen. So until next time, thank you very much.